On today's Locked On Cavs, they got it done. Donovan Mitchell was great. They overcame adversity of their own creating. But the Cavs won a series, winning Game 7. We'll talk all about it on the show today. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and I think all of us sometimes have that competitive side. Download Monopoly Go today, wherever you get your apps, your games. Is the classic twist on Monopoly at Player Google Store. I'm Chris Manning. That is Evan Damerel. Cavs, Evan, got it done. They actually pulled it off after going down by, what, as many as 18 in the first half and looking kind of dead, kind of cooked. 33-15 to 15 third quarter. Donovan Mitchell finishes with a game-high 39, including 15 of 17 from the free throw line. A bunch of other guys contributed in little spots down the stretch, but the Cavs just showed something in the second half, got to a place we hadn't seen them get to in the second half, and they, for the first time since LeBron James left after the 2017-18 season, are headed out of the first round of the NBA playoffs and have won a playoff series. Evan, what is your big take from Cavs Magic 7? The Cavs showed us something that they were certainly lacking in Game 6, but I think just kind of lacking overall, especially after how last season ended or even how before Donovan Mitchell got here in the playing tournament, just with how the Cavs came out flat, uh, especially in that second half against the Hawks, if you want to really think that far back. But this was a really encouraging game just because the Cavs got pretty flat in the first half, and I think you know maybe it is the fatigue that comes with having to play a matinee game and then the home team usually kind of finds their footing and finds a way to power through but i just think it's impressive like cleveland was getting kind of walloped by the magic in the first half especially by palo bancaro and then they held orlando to 18 points in the last two minutes or so of the second quarter in the entirety of the it was 19 points excuse me in the entirety of the quarter and like that's where they just blew this game open and they came out very strong in the third half they came out poised they played physically i think donovan mitchell of course is everything you would hoped he'd advertised and he was advertised to be but like this is just a solid win for the Cavs. i think they definitely worked hard to get this one and now they can reset the table and start focusing on boston on tuesday i think it it you still have concerns i think about like oh, where yeah. this is like what next they, round is they were like. they weren't perfect and, like, I'm sure they don't feel great about some of the season, but for them to win the way they did and not just die after the first half, it, I think there's tells you there's something in there that, I mean, I don't think we knew it was there much less. We didn't think it was there last year. I think we know it wasn't there last year. And I don't know if we knew it was there after game six. Whatever, like, it is that we're getting at. Toughness, grit. Compo- like whatever words or word you want to use to describe it, I it wasn't like a hundred percent. I think we know this is there after the way Game Six went. Yeah, like Game Six was just kind of hard to evaluate overall, just because. Well, not not overall. They they had the lead. I don't think hard. I think like five to six minutes left. Yeah. But it's like it was. You and I talked about it. It was hard to feel good about Cleveland's chances despite coming home and. In the first half, like it really kind of re- reaffirmed those beliefs you and I had after how Game Six went. That the Magic came out like playing like they had nothing to lose. Um, they were very loose. They didn't seem like they were tight. JB Bickerstaff had said pregame like the pressure's not getting to the Cavs, but it certainly felt like otherwise in the first half. And yeah, I think the way the Cavs responded is really encouraging because they just that's a, that's a gear they didn't have at points in this series and especially they didn't have against the Knicks last year and yeah Donovan Mitchell said post game like there's they weren't there's a lot of stuff they have to clean up but now just once they got out of this series it's kind of you know like a share and hopefully now you can just shift your focus to Boston and kind of maybe not play such a muddy mucky style of basketball like Cleveland has been lately yeah and I, and I think been like games three and four the way those went the way they handled themselves like that was not like indicative of a serious team that was capable of this and then they got straight up knocked down 10 8 rounded in the first half and they come back and and mitchell i think is at the heart of all of this mitchell had fit had 85 over the last two games of the series second most ever over the last two games of a series behind alan iverson who had 90 at one point over two games 
Mitchell gave you literally everything he had. I definitely think that guy is beat up. I definitely think that guy is nag dealing with some nagging stuff. And he's absolutely just taking it fully to the end of everything he can give you, even when it's not pretty, even when it's not perfect. He, any any question about, like, even if he wants to be somewhere else or whatever, that that guy that wasn't going to give you everything exactly what he needed to do to get this team a win, and that it meant something to him, and that the way he was riving, reveling up Darius Garland, the way he was clapping, the way he was competitive, like, every little thing tells you how serious Mitchell took this. And even if never, not everyone is going to match that level, could re- meet you at that mountaintop in terms of skill and intensity. That set a tone for this team, I think, particularly coming out of the half. Like that, that like you get Mitchell because he scores a lot of points and he's great, one of the best fifteen guys in the league. But you also, the, the him as a person and as a leader, at least in some ways, because this stuff can happen, is a really, really big deal. Yeah, and I think this game was certainly indicative of the fact that. Last game in game six, he drops 50 points, but nobody else is able to meet him at the summit. Instead, like he was leading with his, but also he was, I don't want to say dragging his teammates with him, but he was certainly like encouraging them to kind of wake up, liven up, not put so much pressure on themselves, especially Darius Garland. But he was very quick to shout out like Karis Levert and um, Isaac Okoro, who were both great in this game. And I think Evan Mobley defensively was very, very good too. But like, Donovan is a player who leads and he is a leader of men, but like you said, like, yeah, he can score a bunch of points, but like when the games matter most or when things that are their tightest, these are the moments when you realize like, this is why the Cavs sold the farm to go get Donovan Mitchell because they can win a playoff series and everything is on the line because they have full faith in his ability. And I think, yeah, again, it is remarkable. The fact that he's playing through like a knee that's essentially jello at this point, but the fact that he's able to just kind of readjust, know what his limits are and still find a way to work within those limits to burst at a hundred percent, or at least try and be as, as lethal as possible when he can be on the floor is yeah, really encouraging, but also just like, you know, tied him out to the fact that like, like you said, like, sure, maybe he moves on from this team at some point, but like, he's not mentally checked out. He's not a guy who's thinking about his next destination. He is fully committed to trying to go as far as possible with the Cavs. And he did say post game like yeah it feels good to get out of the first round but like job's not finished we have to focus on boston now i wish we had more time to do it but it is what it is we just got to kind of get rocking and rolling and ready for tuesday when they head to the garden to face the celtics mitchell in the third quarter 33 to 15 Cavs third quarter played 11 minutes 19 seconds of the quarter 17 points one assist one turnover but seven to nine from the field one or two from three two three from the line this wasn't like he got really hot. This wasn't even like, as the numbers tell you, this wasn't a get hot from three, kind of ride that wave. This was like, I'm going to attack. I'm going to get out in transition, which I, I want to talk about the transition part of this this game a little bit. This was Mitchell putting it to the magic in a way that like he didn't in game six for part of it. He At times it felt like the Cavs offense really stagnated and didn't really like set him up for success in that way. Like, but everything came from Mitchell just going and going and going and going. And again, I think that, like, you know, like, Struce, Struce was great in that quarter, too. We'll talk about him. It's those two guys score most of the points. Okoro has two. That's it. But so this was Mitchell, and it extended from him. Like, unless, whatever he was in his head at halftime, whatever JB and the coaching staff said, whatever, like. Yeah. Yeah, and the, when the players were asked about it, they said, like, Paris LeVert said point blank, like, their confidence never wavered. They fully felt like they were in this game, even when they were down 18. But everyone kept going back to that point in the second quarter when Sam Merrill hit that big three-pointer. And whether it was Garland or Mobley or LeVert or Mitchell who talked about it, they all said, like, yeah, when Sam hit that three, like, we felt momentum was back in our corner, and we could start slowly start building upon this, taking away chunk by chunk, and then... You see them just climb all the way back again by behind Donovan Mitchell's heroics, but like I think it's just you know if the for this team when your leader is leading the charge, it's easy to follow in his footsteps and just kind of um, build upon that momentum. But there is just small moments where like even when Mitchell was just being lethal in terms of scoring, like he was still trying his darndest to get everybody else involved um, and playing fast. Like you had noted, is a big part of that too. I think the Cavs really found something just because it made the Magic uncomfortable in this game, but. Um, yeah, it's not like, yeah, like you said, it's not like a three-point bonanza from Donovan Mitchell. Like, he had to work for his shots, and then slowly but surely, everyone else started getting their, um, th- there were more cooks in the kitchen by the time the fourth quarter was starting. 
All right, after this, let's some of the things that work. We're, we're gonna start with pace, uh, and we can we can talk about. I mean, let's come back. Let's do Mitchell a little more. On Mitchell first, I think he sure. deserves it. Like what, what the last two games have if they have taught you about him? Let's do that, and then we'll we'll get them some one little thing about pace and style that I think got them over the half, over the bump in the second half. That's coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. All right, game off. We got to pause here to talk more about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying. Flag on the play. You already talked about that. But there's so much good stuff in this game. In Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you unlock. And there's so much to get. Unique stickers you can trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes. Cool new pieces to travel the board with. Hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or Robot Panchico Machine. And there's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go, so get off the bench and go download it free on the Google Play or the App Store. Game on. Today's episode is also brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. It's winner-take-all time in the NBA and NHL, and FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring it home of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That is $150 bucks you bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one. So Mitchell, Evan, I think these last two games... As rough as he was last year, and I think like wasn't at his best, he would even tell you this in the in the first part of some of these games. Um, he was, I mean, I some of the better he that that's will solidify him as I think one of the biggest performers of of the first round, and it, it's a reminder of like what he is capable of and and what the places he can get to and and what that can do. Like that is it, what I'm saying is very general and cliche and like we can get into the specifics of it, but mm-hmm. the big picture, like again, that is why you get him and you're not, there's no one else on this team very clearly that is like capable of getting there. Like regardless yeah. of how optimistic or mu- much you like other guys and whatever, none of them can get to where Mitchell got in this game. That, that in itself in a very simple way, I think is a big deal. Yeah, it absolutely is a big deal just because, at least just with what is going on with Mitchell physically, like when it comes to just how he's able to kind of handle the pain and the physicality that Orlando's throwing at him, because the Magic were constantly double, sometimes triple teaming him whenever he had the ball in his hands, which, you know, under, it's understandable. He's the most lethal offensive threat for the floor, on the floor for the Cavs, but he was very precise and mindful with his shots. Um, I can pull the percentages up real quick just to be more transparent about it just in terms of how he shot but like it, it felt like he wasn't wasting possessions or being careless of the basketball at least in the second half I think the Cavs overall were kind of sloppy with the basketball in their hands in the first half I think there's a lot of frustrating turnovers but yeah he was 11 to 27 from the floor two of eight from three um like it's another day in the office for him and like the 15 to 17 from the free throw line I think is the biggest thing just because like that is showing to me like yeah despite the fact that he's uncomfortable Physically, he may not be able to kind of like do everything he wants because of his knee, but he's still showing that comfort and familiarity to attack the basket, to be aggressive, and to, you know, just kind of bait Orlando into fouling him, maybe swiping down on him out of frustration just because he's beating them so badly. So I think that's just a really smart way that Mitchell kind of attacked Orlando's defense that's defended him very well in this series and um, just kind of make their life frustrating, especially in a very pivotal clutch or big time game like this. The the other thing that I think got the Cavs going and got him going was getting out of transition. I haven't pulled the 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 the, the data like the analytical numbers, the cleaning the glass numbers. I have not seen um, and looked at this yet. But if you just look at raw points, fast break points, it's only nine to six advantage. It's not a lot. But I Evan, I felt. I felt to me when I'm watching the game, even if it didn't always result in a bucket or didn't result in a clean shot or whatever, Cleveland made a concerted choice to not let Orlando set. 
and made a choice to not let Orlando get into a, a place where they could rate the, the destruction that the Cavs just had a problem breaking down this entire series. When that happened, there were times where the Magic were getting caught in no man's land. They, were, they weren't crashing the glass to get an offensive rebound, or they weren't getting back fast enough. There was times where you just saw guys like watching. Some of that is fatigue. Like that is a very real thing. This is this was a absolutely slobber knocker of a series. It was hard and physical. All of that. Paolo Bancaro, like for instance, looked exhausted by the time he got to the end of this game, and it's that's understandable as to why. But the Cavs, like what, whatever that adjustment was, or just whatever whoever spurred that, if it was just like we're gonna figure this out, that was a big deal. And you saw it even not just with Mitchell, but. Like Mobley would get a rebound and just go. And that's something he's actually good at on offense right now when he's struggling with a, basically every other part of his offensive game. He can get a rebound and go. Garland would sometimes would go. They were not dragging the ball. Like something they were bad at all year that we talked about a lot in the show was they would they would get a rebound. Garland Mitchell loved to kind of pity patter up the floor. They like to, to set up and get in like 16 seconds on the clock by the time they get into to a set. This game in the second half, when stuff really worked, they were going, 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 going. And like, I wasn't checking time on the shot clock, any of that specifically, but it felt faster. It looked faster. That that in itself is a, a, a small adjustment that matters a lot. And I think it's especially with Garland, like he sometimes has a bit of that Chris Paul syndrome. Where he likes to slow down the offense. He likes to make sure everybody's in place. But like the offense gets moving, like they are a few seconds into the shot clock. They aren't kind of practicing what they preached in the regular season where like in their head it's two real time seconds to cross the timeline to initiate their offense like they aren't playing faster they aren't like really getting into their sets and I think there's like a moment in the first half where um, Evan Mobley has the ball he gets he catches the pass and he's in the one corner Max Struess flares out to the other Mobley attacks the basket Orlando closes out on him and then like kicks the ball to Struess who then it's like a split second too late and it was a shot clock violation. It's just like moments like that where you're like, oh, they're a little out of sorts. They're like a second off kilter, but found a way to kind of find that cadence, rhythm, and timing just to capitalize on how Orlando was defending them and also really begin to impose their will because they really turned the screws on the Magic defensively just to make Orlando very, very uncomfortable, like closing the second half and all throughout the third quarter. What what else? I think that the other thing that unlocked is the kind of hit in this is the shooting. Like just the fact that like when they played faster and then were like whipping guys off of screens and not even like particularly hard screens or like in super intentional like dagger screens or anything or or whatever. But like they just have guys flying around like shooting and like even if you know like Okor doesn't make a, a three in this game, but Stru, you know Struis ends up hitting three and and. You Garland got one off off of a off of an offensive rebound that where they just fired they're firing it around like Sam Merrill had his little dalliance in the first half and like hit two in that way like that stuff did matter and like that what what ends up being like I don't want to say maddening I'm trying to stay like pretty even about this um what what is interesting to me is that like this was in them and like whatever brought it out. I wa- I would love to just know like what what now like like where did this come from in this moment because they yielded something interesting. It's a style that I think they could lean into even more going forward in the, against Boston. It would do them well. It, it gave them like a real identity in a way that sometimes it obviously hasn't felt like they've had one at times in the series. And I, I think maddening is a good way to put it, just because like, I think it's like observers that are you know either ten thousand feet above if you want to get that technical with it or however high we are or far away you are from watching the reserve in this game. But like, it's some of the obvious easy stuff, but like maybe we don't understand the intricacies of how to like combat like opposing defenses and things like that. But yeah, the, the Cavs definitely shouldered what the magic were throwing at them. I think the fact that like Paolo Bancaro got rolling early, but then, you know, I think the Cavs kind of turned it into, all right, Paolo, you have to beat us by yourself and really turned up the screws on the rest of his teammates. So it was like a really smart adjustment by, I think JB Bickerstaff and the coaching staff, just because this is a young team. And yeah, if you can go to a young player and to maybe trying to beat you on his own, like that's your ideal outcome. But looking at it just overall, like I understand like frustrating, but I think it's just like because it seems so obvious to us. But like you said, like yeah, there is some tent pull momentum that they can build off of. There's some identity. There's some there's a ghost inside the machine that's able to kind of keep this rolling. Despite the fact that like this team still isn't hundred percent like Darius Garland, I think his back is probably still bothering him. Mitchell's knee is still clearly bothering him. Allen's availability is still gonna be up in the air until actually back on the floor for Cleveland and like he didn't stand up once 
during this game. He sat on the bench the entire time. Um, so we'll see what happens, but I mean, it, it's a good tent pole or something to build off of momentum wise, just heading into an incredibly hostile environment in Boston. And then also this is a rested Celtics team that the Cavs have to go up against on very little rest. All right. After this, we're going to hit on three guys who contributed in their own way in this game that weren't Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland. Yes. Darius Garland, Evan Mobley. That's up next. Today's episode is brought to you by DoorDash. Moms are a gift, so give her the best gift this Mother's Day. Get the gifts as thoughtful as she is with DoorDash. Select from hundreds of expertly crafted boutiques to the best of tech to self-care essentials and more delivered right to her door. Pair flowers with a gift card so she can celebrate any way she wants. Is she a bookworm? Try a books for a gift card. Does she love a good latte? Get a gift card to her favorite coffee shop. You can't go wrong. Get thoughtful gifts she deserves with the convenience you need. Choose same-day delivery or schedule a week ahead when flowers and gifts should arrive to her door with DoorDash. Shop with savings that would make her proud. With a DashPash membership, you'll save with $0 delivery fees and reduced service fees on eligible orders from DashPash merchants that meet the minimum subtotal. Other fees, including the service plea, apply. Terms apply. Get all your Mother's Day gifts all in one place and and get 50% off your next order up to 50 percent of the $15 when you spend $15 or more on your next flower convenience grocery or retail order now with lock code locked on NBA that is locked on NBA order using DoorDash today terms apply Evan let's sit on Garland because I think that's the biggest one I think the whole game was Donovan Mitchell trying to rev him up and you're going to look at Garland's stat line and go 12 points and three of 13 shooting and four assists and two turnovers and some really boneheaded plays at points in this game. And just uh, looking, I think a little, especially in the first half, but look kind of rattled the three he hits when they, he misses one in the corner. They get the offensive rebound. It goes back to him and he sticks it. Mm -hmm. That felt like a moment where Darius Garland in a series where he's had this at times, but this felt like maybe the final one kind of just like, a, OK, like I, I've gotten through this kind of thing on a human level. That just felt like such a relief for him to actually have done that. And he felt looser and more comfortable after that play. Need to still see where it's going to go. Some consistency yeah. from him would be nice. But that felt like a moment where he maybe is, it kind of settled him down. It was kind of the, the moment he needed. And it was really the, the, the cap on, on the Cavs win. Yeah, and it's understandable, like, even though Garland, this is his second time around the playoffs, like, he's still going to press, like, I think he's just one of those younger players on Cleveland's roster that, like, wants to really just make an impact and kind of find his rhythm and cadence, and, you know, ideally you find it early, and I think there's moments, especially in the first half, where he pressed offensively and took some errant shots, or he took, just had some very inexcusable, just kind of careless turnovers, and um, to your point, like, like Donovan Mitchell, especially, and I think the Cavs as well, like just didn't kind of tell him to back off. And Mitchell shared post game, like he told Garland, because there's that clip of him, I think during the third quarter, where he has his arm around Garland and he's like a, clearly hyping him up. And then um, Tom Withers asked uh, Mitchell post game, like, what was the message? And Donovan's like, listen, I don't care if you're missing every shot. I don't care that the fans are booing. I don't care. Like, I just need you to be you and be yourself out there. And I'm going to help you find that. And I think, like, you know, just having, like, that voice, voice, vote of confidence in a guy who's had a very turbulent season in Darius Garland and players always helpful. But I think for me, just the fact that, like, yes, Isaac Okoro corrals that offensive rebound. And it was that offensive rebound was off of a Darius Garland miss where, like, it felt like it was he got a wide open look. And it just didn't go in. But like Mitchell drove to the basket and immediately passed it back to Garland. And Garland ripped it and made it with conviction. And then he saw them have that moment like immediately after because Orlando called a timeout. And it was just them kind of just celebrating one another. And you just tell like, yeah, this is uh, kind of the calming presence that maybe Garland needed just to find a little bit of stability. And just find a little bit of normalcy. And then like what has been a very chaotic season and a very chaotic series for Garland personally. Especially after just how lackluster he was in game six. Okoro had some really good stuff on Paolo in the second half too. So shout out to him for yeah, right there. Yeah, he definitely um, stepped up to the task because Paolo was red hot and then Okoro really made him work for those shots just to kind of wear him down completely in the second half. And I think that was definitely key in Cleveland pulling out this game. 
Evan Mobley, another guy that I think just deserves some love here. Offensively, like we're it's going to be a bit of an adventure with him. I think yeah. is where it's at right now, particularly when Allen comes back. But 16 boards, um, five blocks, 11 points, physical, really mm-hmm. good stuff as a defender in this game. I like defensively the series. He's been really good. The other stuff, well, you got to figure out. But I think defensively in this game and and when the Cavs have been good in the series, Mobley's been awesome. Um, and and he he delivered in that in that particular way I think today. Yeah, and I think he was really effective when the Cavs started leaning on like Donovan Mitchell's the primary ball handler, surrounding him with shooting, as in like the combination of like Karis LeVert, Isaac Okoro, Max Strus, George Niang, whatever else. Like you cobble that together, then you have Evan Mobley be the big man in that situation, and it's a lineup the Cavs use quite a bit when um, Mobley is out with the knee injury, and they leaned on Jared Allen. But um, the fact that like the Cavs were kind of able to unlock that and I think make Mobley feel very impactful whether it's just like and I hate the term but like screen assists and stuff like that like he was making impacts on offense even if his scoring acumen wasn't there he was very commanding uh, defensively he had 10 blocks can combined in these last two games so I think yeah I think the, I, I said last game like the, the blocks don't mean nearly as much if Mobley's not able to kind of make an impact on the offense but with what the Cavs are trying to ask him to do, which is, you know, kind of play out of position at center because he's more of a natural power forward just because of his frame, maybe just how he's just, you know, situated to playing at this level right now. Um, they're asking to play the five, play much more physically against a very physical, large Orlando team. I think Mobley played very, very well and um, really responded just to a lot of like how hard Orlando was hitting him after how hard they hit him in game six. Mac Drews, the last one. Quiet series for him overall. His yeah. shooting percentages are not going to be anything to write home about. But the threes he hit in the third, the confidence, the the verve he played with in that quarter, paired well with Mitchell. It's why you get Struce. It's why, like, even if he's not actually a plus plus shooter, teams do react to him, and he can get hot in these little moments. And he shoots with confidence even when he's struggling and has struggled an entire series. That was a big deal for for yeah. just any like frankly just for anyone else to support Mitchell and give Mitchell like something was needed in that moment. This does not happen unless one other person steps up and, and does something with Mitchell. Struce was that guy. Big, 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 big spot for him. Yeah. Big spot for him. He was a big momentum shifter in this game. It is always interesting how confidence is so fluid in sports, like whether it's making a free throw or making a shot. But I think once Struce saw the ball go in once from a perimeter attempt, he felt very comfortable in the third quarter and he really was part of that concerted effort to, one, keep momentum in Cleveland's corner when there's moments and maybe Orlando is kind of nipping back a little bit and Struce would just kind of hit a very, not deep, but like a pull-up three-pointer. And like that just kept momentum in Cleveland's corner and just, you know, makes it easy to feed off the energy the crowd is giving you and everything else if you're able to hit big shots like that. And you're absolutely correct. Like these are the moments like why the Cavs made a concerted effort to go get shooting in free agency. And Max Struce definitely showed why spacing is so helpful, especially when they are able to use these lineups where they have one guard, one big out there. Struce is just a guy who can stretch out defenses. And you had noted this, like the, the Cavs went downhill for the better part of this game. And then it opened things up for guys like Struce. Like that's why you have people like that. So, you know, they take, they take those shots, they'll reliably make them too. Even if he hasn't had the best series, this was a good one to close it out on. Yeah. Particularly in a world where like you, on top of you being able to get downhill and beat the Orlando defense, you shut them down in the second half with your ability to keep them from driving. Like, you you were the better team in that way in the second half. And, like, that flip absolutely flipped the game. So there's the Cavs. Oh, yeah. They are off to Boston. Tuesday is game one. No poor Zingas for Boston. We'll see about Jared Allen. We'll see about what the Cavs look like. We'll see what their energy level's like. But they did it. They have advanced. They, the they, they accomplished something that I think they absolutely had to do this year. They, um, they've... They, they, they had they, they, they had accomplished something they have the franchise has not accomplished in over thirty years. Yeah, they've made the yeah. second round without LeBron on their roster. The first time, like I, I was barely alive when that happened. Yeah, I don't think anyone on the team like probably remembers it. Would be my guess. Probably not. No, um, but still, like it's just crazy and yeah, fun game. Good, good job for the Cavs and. We will talk more about uh, this upcoming series of Boston because I think it is going to be a completely different beast. But no, Porzingis does give a little bit of ammunition for a Cleveland team that is not as rested as they are. Yeah, I would just say, like, 
if the Cavs were more normal against Orlando, I would be like maybe like I would feel, but the Cavs still like this is the them them winning game seven is about as good of a, a way to like build on on something that we've seen from them but at this like let's just let's see them be normal for two games in a row before i'm like all right they're gonna take Hell. boston to six you know like let's let me let's see what it looks let's see what it looks let's Completely see them be normal fair. Completely baby fair. steps baby yeah. step the cleveland cavaliers but big win for them it's locked on Cavs for monday maybe you're listening this late sunday We'll be back with you Tuesday um, ahead of Cavs Celtics. Recap, obviously, of the game, if not in Boston, but we'll, we'll cover that for you as soon as we can after that game. Until then, I'm Chris. That's Evan. Thanks again to Jake Stevens, as always. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.